Okay, Geraint, a question this week that I get an awful lot. So previous experience has told me that whenever I give a talk, uh, as we often do at, say, amateur astronomy societies or anything else, no matter what I've talked about, someone always wants to know, is there life elsewhere in the universe? So that's our question for today. The, how, how do we approach it? Of course, th that question is always asked, but we also always have the retired gentleman who has this theory about how the universe works <laughs> and points out that we're idiots. But yes, yeah, today's topic, well. is there life in the universe? And I mean, we could make this a very short video and just point out that we don't really know mm -hmm. if there's life in the universe. But of course, there's an awful lot of discussions about life in the universe and an entire mm. sub-discipline of astronomy called astrobiology, where people sort of envisage what kind of life could be out there. So, so I think what we need to do is start by talking about the universe and the statistics. And you know, this is along the lines of this famous um, Drake equation. Mm. Um, but uh, let's just start with stars and planets, right? right? So over to you, let's t do some numbers about stars and planets. Right, so where could life end up? So uh, the universe, basically there's galaxies and then there's the space between galaxies. And there's not a lot of stuff in the space between galaxies, even if you're in a cluster of galaxies. Mm -hmm. So how many galaxies are out there in the universe? Well, we uh, we can observe the night sky as, as deeply as we can and we can sort of count up how many we see in our little pencil uh, beam survey the night sky and the number we get for that is is roughly a uh, hundred billion or a trillion so the number has either 11 zeros or 12 zeros or something along those lines just uh, yeah. just a little note for our audience notice how easy it is for an astronomer to say a oh, hundred billion a trillion as if they're basically <laughs> the same thing <laughs> yeah. factors of 10 don't really matter but. yeah we, we get a lot of practice dealing that one with our bank accounts and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah uh so that's that's number of galaxies in the observable universe, right? There might be more that we can't see, which are too far away for us to see, but let's just deal with what we can see at the moment. Okay, how many stars are there per galaxy, roughly? Well, we know that best for the Milky Way, which is ours. And again, it's like kind of weirdly, it's about the same number. It's a number with about 11 zeros. It's about 100 billion. Yeah. Okay, let's multiply those two together. The number of stars in the known universe is a number with about 22, 23, maybe 24 digits in it. Yes. So it, it's something massive along those lines. And it's, it's an interesting number because um, it, when you go through and you, you calculate the relative numbers, there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches in all the world. Oh, right. right. So it's a, it's a kind of handy number to know. That there's an awful lot of grains of sand on a beach. But, right. Yeah. Okay, so now we want to know, well, you, you can't live on a star. Probably no life form can live on a star because... Matter, uh, you know, atoms, all those sorts of things would be broken down into simple pieces. You couldn't have any sort of complexity or yeah. molecules. So, okay, how except, many... in, except in cooler stars. Cooler stars have molecules in their atmospheres. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, but but it's still very um, unpleasant environment. Temperatures yeah. of thousands of degrees. Right. So, how many planets are there now? There's been since we discovered the first planet outside the solar system in about 1995. There's been a lot of effort from astronomers in the last couple of decades to look yeah. for planets outside the solar system one of the problems is it's easy uh, you find the things that are easiest to find of course. yes it's almost a truism the easy thing to find are big planets really close to their stars and there's two reasons for that one of the methods we have of finding it is we look at the star and we wait to see whether it gets dimmer for a short period of time every now and then right so that's um that will be more obvious if something big goes in front of the star. The bigger it is, the more it will dim, and so that's easy to see. And the more often it does that, so the closer in it is. Right? If it if it dims and then you have to wait 10 years for it to come back around and dim again, then um, that would be very hard to detect. You've got to do a solid 10 years of looking at this thing before you see it twice. So we want to see big, big close things. These are called hot Jupiters, right? Yeah, and don't forget, it's also the, the Doppler method of finding planets, right? And right. similarly... What you're looking for is the way a star moves in response to a planet. And the biggest response you get is when you have a big planet close in. So that too is sensitive to these big planets. Yeah, so basically as the planet goes around, it, the, the star will wobble a bit. When it's on this side, it, you know, it gets... So it, it's, it, they slightly go around each other. So we can see that wobble, same sort of thing. But as we've gotten looked harder, looked deeper, looked longer, we are now sort of getting down to planets that uh, have sort of masses about the Earth and maybe smaller, maybe they're sort of... We're, we're sort of getting out to 
the kind of, you know, it goes around once a year kind of things, maybe sort of Earth-like conditions, and the further on we get with that. But generally, the, the number of planets per star is of order one. Okay. One to ten. One, Let's be an astronomer here, right? One, one. So when an astronomer says one, yeah. <laughs> they mean, you know, maybe it's it's not something like one in a billion and it's not a billion. Yeah. It's not even one in a thousand or a thousand. It's 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 one in ten, maybe ten. It's probably more than one, actually. Yeah. But we're in that... The point is, relative to 23, 24 digits, okay, that's the number of stars we've got. How many planets are there? We can basically say about the same number of planets in the universe. Okay? Yes. So that's chunks of rock, you know, gaseous or otherwise, or just rocky like the Earth is, going around stars in our universe. And now the question is, which one of those which ones of those or how many of those, what fraction, are likely to have life around them? Yes. So so this is an immense number. As you said, this is 24, 25 digit, digit number for the number of planets in the universe. And so the usual argument goes something along the lines of, we don't know how life forms. Mm. Uh, it might be a very rare event, although we do know that life arose relatively quickly on Earth, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the Earth cooled down after what was known as the, the last heavy bombardment when it was hit by lots of asteroids and rocks and things. Surface of the Earth was molten, solidified, got water, etc. Mm -hmm. Very shortly afterwards, you know... <laughs> astronomers again, yeah. Astronomers, yeah. Just yeah. wait a billion years yeah, or something. Half, you know, 500 million years or whatever the time scale is, we had life. Now, so, but that could be an exceptionally rare event, the right kind of chemicals in the right kind of place, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, and, but the usual argument is, is that um, given the, uh, the, the huge number of potential planets in the universe, if you just take that number of planets and you multiply by, you know, a chance of life form in one in a billion, one in a trillion, one in a whatever, you know, you still end up, potentially end up with a large number of places you could have life in the universe. Mm -hmm. In this famous Drake equation, of course, um, the, the numbers at the start, we all know. As you calculate the number of planets, that gives you a very big number. Then these other numbers that which appear at the end about chances of forming life, etc., uh, they tend to be quite small. And the question is, when you multiply these things together, mm. is, does a number come out to be almost zero? Mm -hmm. Or does it come out that, 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 that the universe could be a, you know, completely filled with life, planets everywhere with life on them? So, you know... We don't really know that part of the equation yet. Right. There are some things astronomers can try to get a handle on. So, for example, um, are all sorts of stars equally good? Or there's, there's a suggestion maybe big stars burn, too, burn out too quickly and maybe small stars are a bit too flary. Yes. So, so this is an interesting one, of course. So uh, um, stars are like, like animals that you see on safari, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look out into the universe, you see lots of blue whitey stars but they're actually in the minority and they like seeing the elephants on safari the big ones are obvious but what you don't see is the myriad of mice and other creepy crawlies mm -hmm. around in the grass majority of stars that we have in the universe are these small little red dwarf stars right they're highly numerous but they're very faint and they're very dim and as you as you mentioned, what we've realized recently is that they can be flary they can throw out lots of energy so they're not very they're sort of bad-tempered stars, mm -hmm. bad-tempered stars. So um, the question is, a lot of people are now thinking that maybe these stars, even if they have planets, these flares, constant um, waves of energy being dumped onto planets would keep the planet sterile and stop life forming. At the other end of the scale, you have this issue with the big stars. Not only do they not live for a very long time, and mm -hmm. the bigger stars, it's of order millions of years, yeah. whereas the smaller stars, they live for trillions of years. They also put out a lot of their radiation at very short wavelengths. Yeah. So unlike the sun, which puts out most of its energy in the optically part of the spectrum, hot stars put out lots of ultraviolet into x-rays, etc. So they too might produce a very sterile environment. So we could rapidly reduce the number of potential places mm. uh, where life could form by by saying that we need to rule out all the small red stars and rule out all the, the hot blue stars, and we're left with stars like the sun, which, while are relatively numerous, you know, they are, it really starts to cut down on the number of stars in the universe. There's other issues as well with the planets, of course. I mean, we found lots of planets, but a lot of those... Well, I mean, if you have a very big planet like Jupiter, 
it's basically there's 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 maybe a core down there, but the, most of it's gas, and that doesn't seem to be a a useful environment. Just because at some point you've got to get some chemicals to sort of combine together in enough ways to make something that's life. I mean, we don't know how that happens, but but it seems like a solid rocky planet's the sort of thing where you could actually have that happening. Mm-hmm. The other thing I worry about. Uh, a lot of the planets that we've seen is they're quite close to their stars. And if you put in, in that scenario, you get what's called tidal locking. So the Earth, as it goes around in its orbit, is also spinning, of course, right? That's a year and that's a day. Okay. Uh, but if you get very close to your sun, your star because of the different uh, gravitational pull across the planet, it will eventually, its spin will slow down until one side of the planet always faces its star. So you don't get day and night. You just have a day side and a night side. Now, that creates some uh, pretty interesting weather situations, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, but now the other, like, what we have, you have to ask a huge question. What can life put up with? It- what would life be okay with? So partic- in particular, you would have what's called the Terminator, which is a very cool name for... <laughs> <laughs> for something they should make a film about that. Yeah, they, they should. They should <laughs> some kind of term. Anyway, um, which is basically that the, there's one line around the, around the planet where day and night meet. And you could sort of have half of your house on the day side and half on the night side, and it might be all right in the middle. Could life survive there? These are the sorts of questions where you start now looking at this great big number that we had, and actually things start trimming off. Do we need a, a moon? Do we need, uh, how, how far away from our star do we need to be? Um, do we need uh, to have a, a, a molten core that can handle a magnetic field uh, like, like the Earth has? How much of the stuff that we have here, which we know is, is pretty good here, right? Our, our, our molten core creating a magnetic field for Earth is doing some good things for us. How much of those do we actually need out there in the universe? It, it's, a, it's a hard question. Um, essentially, uh, as you mentioned, people start looking at these and you start cleaving off mm-hmm. the things that would be, be bad for, uh, for life on Earth. We already know that one of the things that's been for our benefit of course is that our sun is relatively stable there's lots of variable stars out there in the universe and lots of flary stars our sun has been been increasing in brightness um and it will continue to increase in brightness but it's you know been doing it very steadily over billions of years Mm -hmm. you also mentioned the moon and the moon of course um when you look at the earth moon system as a lot of people say is is it is, is the moon really a moon in the sense that we're closer to being a double planet at some level the interaction between them is very strong right. i mean jupiter doesn't notice most of the rocks it's got traveling around it but the yeah, moon yeah. plays a big role on earth it produces tides of course the sun does as well but the moon plays its part and there's a there's a, some interesting questions about how the moon interacts with the earth in terms of um the axis of spin of the earth oh, yeah. now, so so this is this is um i've been reading a number of books on on uh this what's known as the rare earth hypothesis is what the both these special features of the earth and one of the interesting things is that um our earth of course is is tilted by 23 degrees that means that when we go around the sun we get appreciable seasons but we don't get ridiculous seasons right so we, yeah. if we were tilted at 90 degrees then you know we our winters and summers would be very very strange you'd have like a so six months of night and six months of day and all this kind of thing. Um, and a, a number of these books have pointed out that, um, you know, it looks like the Earth has had relatively stable climate mm. over billions of years. Now, the, stable is a relative word, right? Uh, we know that the Earth has been through many glaciations and hot periods. There's even this notion of uh, what's known as the snowball earth where the earth gets mm. completely frozen and then uh, that that freezing uh, basically uh, ends once the volcanoes punch through and another thing of course is jupiter right we have that large uh, gas planet in the solar system and it's been very good at hoovering up lots of debris comets that come into the solar system bigger gravitational well get attracted schumacher levy 9 struck uh, jupiter way back in was it 1990 1991 that sounds about right yeah right. somewhere back then um and if that comet had hit the earth then it, you know the effect would have been devastating so maybe jupiter has been acting as some sort of gravitational guardian right right so 
But then, I mean, there's a theory that we're here basically, mammals are here because the dinosaurs got wiped out and that took an asteroid. And so, I don't know, maybe <laughs> if you want to get these higher life forms, this is the other side of the Drake equation. Yes. Can we get from life to intelligent life? Yeah. And you've got to look at the history of Earth and go, okay, was that a weird way of doing it or is that like a good way of doing it or is it an all right way of doing it? I mean, at some point, is it, is it useful to sort of start again from scratch to take out some of the bigger things just so you have another shot at what's at the top of the ecosystem for a while? And this is sort of that hypothetical... See, if, if you're a paleontologist or, you know, if you're looking at the history of life on Earth, these are just hypothetical questions. But if you're an astrobiologist yeah. and you want to know whether there's something on that planet over there, that's exactly the question you've got to ask. Yes. So, I mean, some people have I've looked at this in depth and, of course, one of the conclusions might be that maybe life is common, but mm-hmm. the series of events that gets to multicellular life mm. and then up to intelligent, maybe that is very rare. Now, we... Um, life on earth the vast majority of the time of life on earth was single cell organisms yeah. right we forget this it's called the the precambrian era uh, and it 95 uh, percent of earth's history or 85 percent of earth's history was this period before multicellular life came along right. so life could be common but it could be the equivalent of pond scum through the universe well let's have a think about just to finish off could we actually observe one of these other planets an exoplanet and see evidence of light. We wouldn't see people waving at us, of course. But it's been suggested perhaps if we saw an atmosphere that had a lot of free free oxygen in it, that might be evidence for life because uh, oxygen would tend to be used up very quickly unless there was something continually producing That's it. That's right, yeah. What, what could we see in an exoplanet that might tell us that maybe there's life on that planet? Well, there's a couple of things people are trying to do. I mean, I guess we have to mention SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and they're scanning the skies effectively for communication signals or radio signals or television signals from from potential civilizations. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, that then is looking for only the intelligent life. Mm -hmm. And there are other searches for intelligent life that people are doing, right? Intelligent life is probably going to need to use a lot of energy. And of course... An immediate source of energy are stars. Mm -hmm. And there's this notion that once you become technologically advanced enough, you might want to um, basically harvest as much energy from a star as you want to, as you can, I should say, right? So you basically encase the star, but you process starlight into lower, uh, lower forms of energy, into infrared radiation. So if there was a civilization that could do that and it was spread throughout the galaxy, and remember, if you, if you have an interstellar, uh, species, they could they could colonize the galaxy in in ten million years, which is long right. to us, but very short period of time compared to the life of the galaxy. Yeah, they'd be obvious. We would we would see these sources of infrared radiation, and we we don't we don't really see these signals from these technologically advanced life forms. Mm-hmm. So the question is, um, as you said, planets with life, but not necessarily intelligent life, and um, again. We have to be very careful because for a long time, life on Earth didn't produce oxygen. Yeah, it was very true. happy with its uh, carbon dioxide kind of uh, atmosphere and just stay in that way. And in fact, it was one of the great upheavals of life is when the first oxygen producing life came along. Yeah, but we could look for what's what's known as um, non equilibrium chemistry. Mm. As you said, you think about what's going on in the atmosphere and uh, you think about the chemicals are there and if you look at like planets like uh, Venus and Mars which are rich in carbon dioxide that's that's a very equilibrium kind of mm. chemistry it just stays that way nothing's been replenished etc if you find chemistry that's out of whack that something needs to be producing it then life could be a possible so that's what people are sort of looking for are these non-equilibrium signatures but of course even if you find one you have to rule out all sort of non-life mm, yeah. form processes before you can conclude there's potentially life there. So this is why this question, when it gets asked of us in a popular astronomy talk, is uh, is a bit of a loaded one because the answer is I would need about 20 minutes to explain why the answer is we don't know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs>